Right, the last section of this chapter, we were talking about behavior, and um, the behaviors that we talked about in that section tended to be behaviors that are innate or instinctual, so um, stuff that they didn't have to learn. Now, the behaviors we're going to talk about next have to do with behaviors that are um, actually learned behaviors, um, and some of these are kind of a little bit strange, but they're really interesting. Um, so the first one we're going to talk about that I have a picture of up here is habituation. And what habituation actually is, is getting used to something so that you can kind of drone that constant stuff out and listen for the important stuff that's going on. So prairie dogs are a great example of this. So um, this is actually going to be the guard that you see here. And what prairie dogs do is um, the guard will actually sit there and if you've ever been to a prairie dog town, they're really loud. Everybody's chirping and blabbering around. And what will happen is if the guard sees something like a predator coming and if it saw you coming up to the prairie dog town, it would think you were a predator. And so it will do this high-pitched squeal and so what happens to all the other, uh, I don't know why that always comes up. Um, now what happens to the other prairie dogs in there is that they're used to hearing all that chitting and chatting and all that kind of stuff going on. Then they can habituate that out and listen for the really important stuff, which is that guard. So you guys have probably done it in class. If somebody, you know, your professor's standing up there and everybody's blah, 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 blah in the beginning of class and the professor says, well, next class we're going to have a quiz. Everyone's going to shut up and they're going to hear that, right? Because they're kind of always keeping an ear out for the professor to talk, right? So that's what habituation is. Um, definitely helps with survival and reproduction because it allows them to listen for the important things that could save their life or tell them where food is or something like that. Okay. Um, the next one is a kind of a cute one that um, cartoons usually make fun of, and that's going to be something called imprinting. So um, you can see in this picture here, this is um, Lorenz. He's famous for doing imprinting um, uh, experiments. But in the cartoons, you've seen it where they have like the little egg open up, and then you've got the little duck, and it looks at the cat and goes, Mommy, right? That's kind of making fun of imprinting. And so what it is, is when something is born, there is going to be a set amount of time. That's called a sensitive period. And that's going to be the amount of time where they can learn these very important behaviors from their parent. And um, once that sensitive period is gone, they can't learn that behavior anymore. It's true for us. It's true for animals. And so what he did is he did imprinting experiments with these geese. And you can see them following him because they imprinted on him. Um, so imprinting is really important because it allows a bond to form a lot of times between the mother and the offspring and it also allows them to learn a lot of important behaviors that over a very short period of time so imprinting is really cool um, with humans they found some interesting stuff like when they found babies that have been you know raised by wolves in the forest like they wouldn't be able to teach them certain behaviors as adults because that part of their brain brain I can't speak that part of their brain has already grown and so that part of their sensitive period is over so really really cool stuff um, here's an interesting one that they did with imprinting they were having problems with these birds um, they were almost going extinct because they'd been blown off course to where they usually migrate to mate and so what happened was they weren't going to the area to mate, they weren't mating, and so their population was going down really fast. So someone said, well, what if we imprint them on this glider and we take the glider to the place where they used to migrate and maybe conditions will be right there for them to mate. So sure enough, they did that. They got them to imprint on this glider and unbelievably, they do go back to that island now and they do um, mate there. So... This is a controversial thing. Some people said, how could you do that? That's nature. Let it take its course. And other people said, well, it was probably something we did to make them stop going there, so why don't we help them get back there? Um, another person against it said, well, what if another plane flies over and they chase it? You know, So um, definitely pluses and minuses to a lot of this stuff. And that's going to be the case in a lot of things we talk about in this class. So that's going to be imprinting. Um, the next one is spatial learning. This is awesome, too, and you do this all the time without thinking about it. So um, spatial learning is when you have landmarks in an area um, that you know where they are and you kind of associate with those. And so um, to give you an example, this that you're seeing here is the shortest PhD ever done. And so this is a PhD that was done about this wasp and um, how it likes to make a nest in the ground. 
And so the hypothesis was that they used spatial learning and landmarks to actually help them find where their nest was. So what the scientists did is they actually recreated that in an area where there was no nest. And what happened was that wasp just kept going right into the ground like, I know there should be a nest there, what's going on? And so that proved that it was using spatial learning. So we do it all the time. If you come in your house and the lights don't turn on because a bulb went out, you know like where your nightstand or whatever is. Um, when you walk in and where the couch is, you have a basic idea. That's spatial learning. Or if someone gives you directions and they say, at the gas station, turn right, and then when you see this house, turn left, that's spatial learning as well and using landmarks. Uh, my favorite example is my old dog, Roxy. She um, was diabetic, and so she went blind pretty early. And I was like, well, I don't want to put her to sleep just because she's blind. And the vet said, no, she'll be fine. She's going to use landmarks in your house, she said. But I hope you have your furniture exactly where you want it because if you move it, she is definitely going to knock into it. And sure enough, this dog could book through the house. No problem. But there was a day I forgot to push in a chair, and it was, let's just say it was ugly. So that's all going to be spatial learning, and spatial learning uses cognitive maps, which are maps like that's kind of in your nervous system that, that your brain makes between all the different things that are in your house. Um, and those things that you're actually learning where they are, those are called landmarks. So pretty awesome stuff there. All right, this next one, associative learning. Um, associative learning is associating something with a learned behavior. And um, so there's a lot of examples of it. Um, here's an example. This is actually the um, monarch butterfly caterpillar, and it feeds on milkweed. And milkweed is a poisonous plant, or it tastes really bad and can make you sick. And so birds avoid that caterpillar because they know it's going to make them sick, right? So they've associated getting sick with eating that. That's what we're talking about here. Now, there's two forms of it. Um, the first form is classical conditioning. And classical conditioning is going to be um, when you actually have something that is completely unrelated to the behavior or to the animal itself, and they somehow um, associate a behavior with it. Best example is Pavlov's dogs. So what Pavlov did is every day when he fed the dogs, he rang a bell, and um, they would salivate because they knew you know, they were about to eat. And then one day he just rang the bell, and they salivated even though there was no food. That's classical conditioning. Um, you, you, if you've ever trained a dog, you've probably, if you've ever used one of these, this is a clicker. Um, so that's the sound it makes. And what you can do is, I have a, another dog that's fat, and I don't want her to be eating treats all the time. So you can actually click every time you give them a treat, and then they associate that click with a positive feeling, and so you don't have to give them a treat every time they do something correct. Um, just to show you, uh, this one down here definitely is not classically conditioned because she doesn't care at all that I just did that with the clicker. Um, now, I do have a video um, um, for the next part of the other type of conditioning, and that's going to be operant conditioning. And operant conditioning is going to be something that you do um, where you associate something positive or negative with the behavior, but it has to do with your well-being. So in this video here I just did, um, I'm actually trying to get my dog to sit, and I have a treat, right? So what she's going to do is she's going to sit because she knows she's going to get a reward for it. So here I go to tell her to sit. And she sits and she gets a treat. The reason she's sitting is because she knows she's going to get a treat. Now, um, I, can, I do another little one here where I tell her to stay. And you can see she knows I have a treat in my hand. So she's doing anything I say, right? And she's watching. And she's doing that because I'm going to give her a treat. So that's going to be um, operant conditioning. Now, I'll, I've got another lovely picture of operant conditioning, this poor little coyote here, right? So obviously that coyote went after a porcupine and learned that that was a bad idea and will probably never go after a porcupine again. So that's going to be associative learning. Okay. Um, now the last little part here, we're going to get into um, mating behavior and why they choose certain mates and that type of thing. Um, so I hate telling college students this, but most organisms are promiscuous. And what that means is they have multiple partners throughout their life. Um, however, there are some out there that are monogamous. Um, these swans that I'm showing you right here are monogamous species. So that's like the main reason that swans are used as like a symbol of love because they mate for life. Most birds 
birds actually will mate for life like that. Um, so uh, monogamous species, one way you can tell is if you look at this picture, you can't tell which one is male and which one is female just by looking at them. And that's because monogamous species, the sexes tend to look just the same. Um, and that's because they mate for life and there's not really a lot of competition throughout their life to be uh, mating with anybody else. Now, if you look at um, polygamous species, you can see that you can tell the difference between a male and a female right here. You can see the male on the left and the female on the right. So what um, this actually is, is a specific type of polygamy called polygyny. And um, this is where you have one male mating with a bunch of females. Okay, so um, usually when whatever one is mating with a bunch of the other, they tend to be the showy ones, right? So um, when you see a showy male like that, that probably means you have one male mating with a bunch of females. Um, this is an example of a polyandrous species. Polyandry means that you have one female mating with a bunch of males. So at the top here, that's actually um, a female, and you can see how it's showier than the male down here. Um, this is also an example of a polyandrous species. This is actually the female underneath here, who's a lot bigger and a lot more colorful. And then you have the male, um, who's a little smaller and less showy. So we'll give them their um, privacy in a second. Um, so if we go back to this, um, what this is showing, and we actually talked about this in the skull lab, looking at the gorilla skulls, is the, um, showiness. And um, that showiness is called, or the difference between male and female is called sexual dimorphism. So what that means is you can definitely visually see a difference between male and female, not just based on um, the genitals or anything like that. It's just size and ornate horns or something like that. So that's chapter 51, super awesome one about behavior.